All right, so the class is being recorded right now as we speak, and the audio and also the visual are both recording from the correct source. So we're going to get started with um, floating point number representation. Uh, I'm hoping you guys had a chance to pre-read the module, okay, because you know, that actually is an important thing to do. <clears throat> All right, so this is the, um, the module. This is... Uh, let's see, no, not this one, but this one here. All right, so we're going to talk about your know, floating point numbers. Specifically, we're going to talk about the double, okay, the double type that you might have learned from CISP 360, because that's the type that you need in order to represent real numbers in quotes, okay? Because you know, there's no such thing as the ability to re to um, to represent real numbers, because real numbers you know, include irrational numbers. And irrational numbers require an infinite number of digits, regardless of the base, to represent. Okay, so there's no actual way to represent irrational numbers. <clears throat> so the way I'm going to do this lecture is the opposite of what I did yesterday with my Tuesday Thursday class. So for those of you who are curious about, okay, what is the other way to make the presentation of the same material, you can also watch the recording from Tuesday or you know, from yesterday. So I, what I'll do is I'm going to go opposite entirely, almost entirely, and I'm going to start with you know, B, D, F, you know, and so on. So we'll start with you know, the uh, concept of what the float is. So a double it has 64 bits, okay? So I think that concept is okay. You know, we have 64 zeros and ones in a particular order, okay? The question is how do we interpret those 64 zeros and ones? So that is the question. But in order to specify how those individual zeros and ones are used, I need to make sure that we understand this notation, which is f with a subscript of i refers to bit i of you know, the 64 bits. So this i can range from 0 to 63 in the case of a double, because a double has exactly 64 bits. So are we doing OK so far in terms of the notation that I will be using? Okay, so F, the entire thing, refers to the 64-bit pattern, and then F subscript I refers to bit I of the entire 64 bits. <clears throat> so what follows here you know, is a very you know, text description. Bit 63, which is the most, the most significant bit, is called the sign bit. It is not quite the same as the sign bit in signed interpretation of integers. This one really just indicates whether the entire quantity is negative or not negative. If the sign bit is a one, it is negative. If the sign bit is a zero, it is not negative. And in bit 52 to 62, these 11 bits is um, basically the biased exponent of two. Okay, I'll explain that in just a little bit. <clears throat> and then from bit zero to bit 51, these are known as the fraction of the mantissa. So what I'll do is I'm going to introduce this equation first, and then we'll kind of use an example to illustrate how to read this. So forget about this part here, okay? So this part you can just kind of skip and not read it for the time being. So we start with BD of F, okay? So the, so the convention that I've been using in this class is this little subscript here tells us what kind of interpretation we are looking at. So a subscript of D means we are using double as a, as, a way, as a way of interpreting. Um, D is value, and this is F as a bit value. In other words, we are looking at the double interpretation of the pattern known as F, and we want to figure out what value it is representing. Is that okay? So in that sense, you know, it is similar, even though it's not exactly the same, as the DS and the DU you know, definitions, because those are for signed and unsigned integer interpretation. This one is for a floating point number interpretation. So that's why you know, there's no width, the number of bits you know, as a W next to the F, because we know that there, there, ha there has to be exactly 64 bits. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So now we look at this portion of the equation. Let me just magnify this because it is important for us. And so I'm going to magnify as much as possible because I want to kind of point to each individual component so that we can identify what it's doing and how it's getting the job done. 
The first one is only using you know, f, f of 63, which means we are looking at the most significant bit here. The most significant bit, which, are, which can only be a zero or one, is the exponent of negative one as one of the components of the product. So if f of 63 was zero, we have negative one raised to the power of zero. And what is the value of negative one to the power of zero? It's just one. Okay, very good. What about, uh, what if you know, f of 63 is one? Then we are raising negative one to the power of one, which gives us negative one. Negative one, okay. So that really is just another way to specify um, what I said a little bit earlier verbally, which is you know, if f of 63 is, uh, is a one, then the entire quantity is negative. Otherwise, the entire quantity is non-negative. Is that okay? <clears throat> So now we look at this hot mess here, okay? So it looks like a mess, but at the same time, it does look like something that we should have seen already, okay? In other words, we look at this and go like, okay, so other than we have this kind of weird one plus here, the sigma notation does seem to have, oh, yeah, so the sigma notation seems to have the format that we have seen already, even though there's a certain offset to the whole thing. In other words, we are looking at each digit from digit zero all the way up to digit 51, and we're multiplying that digit by some kind of power of two. Is that okay? But instead of looking at you know, f of i times you know, uh, two to the power of i, there's an offset of 52. So, so can someone tell me what happens when f equals to negative 52? If f if i is negative 52, which digit am I looking at? Zero, very good. So we're looking at f subscript zero. And what power of two am I multiplying to digit zero? It would be two to the power of whatever i is, and i was negative 52. Okay, so very good. So that means f of zero is multiplied by Two to the power of negative 52. F of 1 is multiplied by 2 to the power of negative 51. F of 2 is multiplied by 2 to the power of negative 50, and so on. Okay? So that means, you know, other than a certain quote unquote offset between the bit position and the power of 2 that we are multiplying. It's kind of doing the same thing. What about when i equals to negative one, which is you know, the last value of this equation? When i equals to negative one, which bit am I looking at? It would be f of so 51, and it's multiplied by two to the power of negative one. Okay, very good. So that should tell you that this entire summation is not gonna add up to one. It can get close, okay? If every single digit from digit zero to digit 51 are all ones, then the sigma notation, this entire sigma notation, will give you a value that is really close to one, but it is still less than one. Are you convinced, okay? Because this entire sigma notation can only give you like one half plus one quarter plus one eighth plus one sixteenth and so on. And it will be a really, really long term because we have 52 terms over here. But nonetheless, it can never add up to one. But we're adding one to it, okay? So that means everything in this parentheses is going to range from one to just a little bit less than two. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> and then we multiply this entire thing by two to the power of <laughs> another hot mess over here. So we'll take a look at this hot mess. So the one question I have is, when you see something like this, you know, what do you do with you know, the sigma notation? My recommendation is to plug in the first and the last value just to see you know, what is the range it is specifying, both in terms of what digits am I looking at and also what powers of two am I multiplying. So plug in the extreme values, just like what I did with this one. So when i equals to zero, which bit am I looking at? We're looking at 50, bit 52, very good, which is either one or zero. 
the one power of two and I multiply it to this this is two. This is the power of zero. Okay. So the next one is going to be fifty-three, which is multiplied by two to the power of one, blah blah blah, and so on. The last one is going to be fifty. Fifty. Oh, not fifty. The last one is going to be what? Fifty. Sixty-two, and it's multiplied by two to the power of ten. Very good. Okay. So that means you know we are treating that portion of the bits you know a little bit differently from the rest, and and then once we have this summation. Now, it should be fairly clear to us that this entire thing is non-negative. Are we convinced that this has to be non-negative? Because every bit is either a zero or one, and every power of two is also non-negative. So when you multiply a non-negative value by a non-negative value, you get a non-negative value. And when you add up a whole bunch of non-negative values, you also end up with a non-negative sum. Is that okay? But this entire thing, okay, this entire sigma notation, whatever it comes up to be, we are going to subtract 1,023 from it in order to become the actual exponent of 2. And then we multiply this power of 2 with to the rest of the product. And that becomes the value that is being represented by the bit pattern f when we choose to interpret pattern f as a double. Is that okay? Okay, it sounds like a mouthful, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use an example, okay? So let me go ahead and start up Joplin because I got this all worked out in the lecture in yesterday, but this time we're gonna work, work it out you know, backwards. So we will start with you know what I ended up yesterday and then we'll go backwards from it. So let me go here, go back to yesterday's you know, lecture note. Um, let's see, today is, yep, yeah, so this is the lecture note from yesterday. I cannot remember where I, okay. hmm. All right, so let me go do that next. And right now we're gonna take row first. Okay, so this is the row taking activity for today. The password is, not surprisingly, double. <laughs> so I'm just gonna write this on the whiteboard. Okay. So you guys go ahead and do this and I am gonna dig up my notes from yesterday. Oh, I know what happened. And yesterday I was using not Joplin, I was using a text editor. So let me go to mousepad. Yep, that's what I did last time. Okay. All right. When you guys are done you know, taking notes, you know, I will continue with the lecture. <clears throat> All right. Looks like everybody is done with row taking. Is that correct? Does anyone need more time? Okay. You need more time? All right, are we good to go? Okay, so we're gonna take a look at this you know, highlighted you know, thing here. This is not in decimal, it is not in binary, this is in hexadecimal. In other words, it is specified in base 16. So the way I can tell this is you know, a base 16 number has to do with, it starts with zero x, so the prefix of zero x specifies that the rest of this number is in base 16. So the first question we have is, um, we only have digits 0 to 9 because we normally use base 10. So what are we, what are we going to do with you know, the additional values you know, for, for each digit? 
That's what this table is for. Okay, so this table is telling you that in binary, if you see 0, 0, 0, 0, in hexadecimal, it is a 0. If you see 0, 0, 0, 1 as a base 2 number, it is 1 in hexadecimal. Nothing surprising all the way up to 9, which is 1, 0, 0, 1. It is 9 in hexadecimal because everything all the way from here to here is common to base 10. But then when we look at the bit pattern 1010, which is known as 10 from our perspective, in other words, it is representing this quantity, okay? But there's no one single digit that can represent it because our digits, our numerical digits, only go from zero to nine. So what computer science people do is uh, we just kind of borrow some you know, letters or characters from the alphabet. So the letter A is actually borrowed to represent you know, what we know as 10 as a quantity. The letter B is you know, representing the quantity of 11 and blah, 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 all the way up to the letter F is being used to represent 15 because that's what 1111 as a base two number is representing is the quantity of 15. Is that okay? So we got this table. The nice thing about converting between base 2 and base 16 is you don't need to do multiplication, you don't need to do a mod, you don't need any division, it is all table lookup, okay? So what I'll do is I'm taking this number, okay, so because I want to continue with this slide here, and, okay, so I'm gonna scroll everything off so I can start with a blank slate here. So the first thing I need to do is to turn this into a binary number. So based on the table that we just saw, okay, so you might want to copy that into your own notes in time, okay? But for this part of the lecture, I can do it manually because I'm fairly quick with this, this type of conversion. So for, yes? Yes. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can also sit a little bit up front, you know, that makes it e easier to view the content as well. All right, so the four is a zero, one, zero, zero. Zero is just zero, 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 zero. So the important part here is every hexadecimal digit translates to four zeros and ones, okay? So the zero, 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 you cannot just go like, oh, that is just zero. We'll just use one single zero. It doesn't work that way, okay? You have to use four binary digits. Every base 16 digit corresponds to exactly four binary digits. So you cannot cut off the leading zeros or leave off you know, the trailing zeros. <clears throat> then we have the three, which is a zero, zero, one, one. The five is a zero, one, zero, one. The A is one, zero, one, zero. And then we just got a whole bunch of zeros after that. Okay. Four, five, six. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Okay, there we go. So now we have specified the entire you know, bit pattern. There should be 64 bits here. There should be 16 chunks of four bits. So let's do some counting just to double check and make sure. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So we have exactly 64 bits here. <clears throat> and then the next thing I'll do is I am going to, I, I'm still getting used to this keyboard because the key layout is different from my other keyboard. So the next thing I'm going to do is just to go like, okay, let's remove all the spaces. Okay, we'll make the whole thing into one gigantic string of zeros and ones, getting rid of all the spaces. This is faster using the delete key. <clears throat> All right. So now we want to identify you know, which bits are which bits because we want to know, like, okay, who is bit 0 and who is bit 63. This is bit 63 all the way to the left-hand side. And, of course, you know, then you can go like, oh, okay, so that means all the way over here is bit 0. You would be correct. That is bit 0. But these are not the only two bit positions that are of importance to us because we also want to know where is bit 62 
and bit 62 is right here and I have to turn off uh, insert mode so I can just you know, kind of change these things so the next position that is important is bit 52 so if this is 62 61 60 59 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 there we go so this is bit 52 oops okay 5 2 and this is 5 1 so now we have identified you know the, the chunks of bits that are actually important to us remember you have to read vertically 63, 62, 52, 51, and 00. Zero, zero. Okay. So are we okay with how to read the bit positions? So now we look at these bits and go like, okay, what are we going to do with these bits? Okay, so let's go ahead and do something with the, with the bits. The first one is, um, I think uh, bit 63 is the easiest one. What does it do again? Can someone recall from the equation that we talked about earlier? Yep, okay. So that means you know, in this case, this number is, is it negative? Nope, because it's a zero, so this number is non-negative. Okay, very good. Um, and then the next thing, so I'm going to switch between this and the notes here. Okay, so the next item is this hot mess here. <laughs> so what, what, what are we getting out of this hot mess? Okay, the first bit that we need to look at is bit zero, because when i equals to negative 52, 52 plus i is going to be zero. So we are basically adding a bunch of, you know, uh, powers of two, they're all negative powers um, out of the individual bits. So in this case, okay, I'm just going to say this, okay, sine is a zero in this case. And then we want to look at, you know, the one plus thing, okay, so we have one plus. This is bit 51, which means we have none of the halves, okay. So I'll just em emphasize that we have zero times one half. Um, and then we have a one here, so we have one times one divided by four, which is a quarter. And then we have none of um, one eighth. Okay, so we have zero times one eighth. And then we have one of one sixteenth. And then we have one of one thirty second. None of oops, times none of oops, plus none of uh, 64th, and then finally we have one of 128. All right, so let me double check, okay, because when I'm typing, I cannot really keep track. So this is the number of halves, okay? The bit 51 specifies the number of halves. Bit 50, uh, bit 50 tells us the number of quarters, and we got one of those. This is an eighth, so we got one eighth, this is 16th, we have 116th because that's a one. And then we, uh, did I mess up? Okay, let me check. <laughs> All right, so let me just match the zeros and ones. Zero, one, one, and then a zero, and then a one, and then a one, and then a zero, Okay, so the bits are correct. So now we look at the um, powers of two. Two to the power of negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, negative six, and negative seven. So I think the sequence is correct. Are we doing okay so far? And then plus a whole bunch of zeros, right? I mean, the, the rest are all you know, zero times one divided by 256, blah, 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 and they're all zeros after that. All right. Do we have any questions about this expansion? Yep. If you got 1 over 2, 1 over 4, 1 over 8 from the equation, that's how you got Yes. It. So this is all coming from the uh, <coughs> definition here. Because when i equals to negative 1, then we're looking at bit 51. But that is multiplied by 2 to the power of negative 1. 
So I'm just using that sequence to convert into, to expand the of what we're seeing here. If it will help, okay, I can always put some spaces here so we can see the individual terms a little bit easier like that. Okay. Just add one space after the plus. Okay. And so on. Okay. That's fine. Is that okay? Does everybody see how I applied the definition that we saw earlier to compute this term? So just for easier discussion, we'll just call this term, you know, one thing. We'll let me go back to here. We'll call this term M2, okay? You know, which stands for Matissa in base two, but it's okay. We'll just call it M2 for the time being. And we're gonna actually compute this, okay? Because otherwise, you know, I cannot show you what we have. So basically we have one. Um, so we'll we'll go ahead and try to do this calculation. Um, the smallest, denom the smallest denominator is 128, so we're going to have, we will use that as our common denominator. So now we ask, um, what is a quarter in terms of 128? I guess 32, right? So we have a 32, and okay, so let me just kind of emphasize what we're doing here. We're trying to combine, you know, all the fractions together. So this is the 32nd, the 32 um, when you divide it by 128, that's a zero, we don't have to deal with that. This is a 16, and I think there are eight 16s in uh, 128, so that's an eight. Um, and then the next one is a 30, 32nd, there are four 32s in 128, so we have a four here. And then the next one is, um, oh, yeah, that's 128 already, so that's just one divided by 128. So does everybody see what I'm trying to do here? I'm trying to convert this entire sum, which is kind of messy, into something that looks a little nicer, which is you know, basically a mixed fraction. Okay, I just mentioned a term that you know every word about, but what does it mean? What is a mixed fraction? No need to look at me or squint at me because you all have smartphones. <laughs> Go to Google, find out what is a mixed fraction. A mixed fraction is basically a fraction that also has a whole number next to it. That is what we call a mixed fraction. Okay, so what I'm trying to do is to turn this into a mixed fraction. So now we have one. And then we just have to add up, you know, 32 plus 8 is 40, 40 plus 40. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is there supposed to be a plus 1 after that one, or um, the second one? The second one? It says 1, 22, 22. You mean this one here? No, uh, the one, one in the front. You mean here? Yeah. Yeah, but this is this is supposed to be a mixed fraction. Oh, mixed fraction. I can't oh, yeah. really show a mixed fraction with a okay. plain text editor. Okay. So... But you're correct. You know, if I want to use, uh, it, it's the same having a plus here. You're correct. But as a mixed fraction, uh, 32 plus 8 is 40. 40 plus 4 is 44. 44 plus 1 is 45. So we have basically 45, 128. That's the actual mixed fraction. Are we doing okay? Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So that's M2. Okay. I call this whole thing M2. So now I'm going to work with E2. So E2, let me go back to the definition here. So E2 is going to refer to this portion, okay, this entire thing up here, including the subtraction of 1,023. So we want to figure out what are we adding and what are we subtracting you know, from, from this whole thing. So we are going from, I is going from 0 to 10. So we are looking at F52, bit 52, multiplied by two to the power of zero, and then just go from there, okay? So now we go back to the example. Bit 52 is this one here, and it is multiplied by two to the power of zero, okay? So we're gonna look at this, one times two to the power of zero, plus another one times two to the power of one. That's because this is bit 53, and it has a one in it. 
and then we got a whole bunch of zeros so this time I'm gonna skip the whole bunch of zeros and we'll go all the way to bit 62 which is the last one so now we go to the last one which is also a 1 and this is multiplied it by 2 to the power of 10 so we'll do a sanity check, okay? When bit 62 is a 1, are we supposed to multiply that 1 by 2 to the power of 10? So we go back to the definition again, and we go like, okay, what what happens when i equals to 10? When i equals to 10, f plus, I mean, i plus 52 is going to be 62. So we'll be looking at bit 62, which is what we did earlier. But we're also going to multiply that by 2 to the power of 10, which is also what we did over here. So that's my sanity check to make sure that the equation is correct. And But remember, we have to subtract 1,023 from this entire thing, and that is also specified here, because this entire thing is E2, which is the exponent of 2 that we need to multiply to this entire thing. So we go back here, and we let's say we do some calculation. This is 1. This is, the next one is a 2, and then we have 1,024, and then we subtract 1,023 from the whole thing. So what are we supposed to get here? If you guys can help me with this, 1 plus 2 plus 1,024 is 1,027. 1,027 minus 1,023 is 4, I think. Is that correct? Okay. Okay, so now what are we going to do? Well, the value, okay, that is being represented is basically negative 1, okay, negative 1 to the power of 0, which is 1, times 1 and 45, uh, 128th, <laughs> and then times 2 to the power of 4, okay? In other words, I have individually identified the sign, the middle term, you know, of the original notation, and also the power of 2 as the last component of the product, okay? So that's, you know, so when you are writing your notes, okay, it's, in, it's important to kind of map this to, you know, this equation over here. So now we look at this and go like, okay, so let's try to figure out what value we are looking at here. So we are looking at, um, basically this boils to, to 1. And then the quick way to uh, do this multiplication is we have 16, and then we have 45 divided by, um, let's see, 120 divided by 16 is 8, I think, right? Okay, so now we have, you know, basically, okay, 1 times whatever is just whatever, so we just focus on the other side. Uh, what is 45 divided by 8, or what is the, the mixed fraction representing 45 over 8? Okay, let me, let me write on the whiteboard you know, of what I'm trying to solve here. So we have 16 and what, 45 over 8, okay? So the question is, what is that? It's 5 and 5 eighths, okay? So basically we're looking at 16 plus 5 and 5 eighths, which is 21 and 5 eighths. Is that okay? Good. Okay, so let me just write this down and then we'll I'll see if I can address any questions about this. The 16, this mixed fraction, okay, if you look at this fraction, mixed fraction, you can always look at the mixed fraction as the whole number plus whatever fraction is after the whole number. So you got 45 over 8, or 16, 45 over 8, because of the 2 to the power of 4, right? Yeah, because okay. because I multiply, yep. because this is in the denominator, and this is a 16, which is in a, basically it's the numerate, part of the numerator. So when we, uh, so this 16 is going to cancel out the you know, 16 of the 128, which leaves us the 8. If you don't want to do all this mental math, it's okay. Just you know, <laughs> figure this out on the calculator, 
and then multiply that by 16, and we still end up with you know, 21 and 5 eighths, which is also known as 21.625. All right. So this exercise is the backwards exercise of what I did on Tuesday, which is yesterday, because yesterday I started off with the value that I want to represent, and then I converted the whole thing into the double representation. Today, I do the exact opposite. I started off with the representation with zeros and ones, and then go backwards to figure out what value it is actually representing. All right. Are we, do we have any questions? I'm going to pause here and see if I can address any questions. Any questions? Okay. So I am going to guess, okay, since you guys are not asking anything, I'm going to guess this notation is a little bit hard to read, okay, which is probably the case, okay, because, you know, this is um, a pretty long expression. So the idea is you need to read this notation and be familiar with it, okay. What are we adding? What, what is the sigma notation actually adding? What bit in the 64 bits is being multiplied by which power of 2 and also the same thing over here? Because if I need to summarize this entire module, which is you know, what is a double representation, that's it. It is summarized by one single definition. Everything else stems from this one single definition, which also makes this definition very important. So are we doing okay so far at this point? Okay, we are good, all right. <clears throat> so the other thing you can also do, because I, that's why I asked a little bit earlier, did you guys read ahead? Because you know, it is important to read ahead, okay? There's no way that people can be very successful in this class without reading ahead and also you know, reviewing the material after a class, except for very few individuals, okay? But most people need to read ahead you know, in, this, in terms of this class. So this is a link, okay? It links to a Wikipedia page. The Wikipedia page give, uh, gives us something just like that, except it is prettier because it's got colors, okay? So instead of using my really archaic you know, text representation of this is bit 63, this is bit, si bit 60, this is bit 52, this is bit 51, and this is bit zero, and those are the cutoff points of the different portions, it is color-coded, okay? But that's it, okay? They are both trying to represent exactly the same thing. In Wikipedia, they also attempt to kind of explain what is the value being represented. And you can see that there's some resemblance, okay, to what I you know, presented. But they're not very clear about how this E is calculated. So instead of me explaining, okay, this is how we calculate the E, blah, 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 I just go like, okay, well, okay, excuse me about this one. So what I decided to do is I just gave you the entire E, which is this little smaller sigma notation over here. Are we still doing okay? All right. So let me take a look at the time. Okay, I think we got time here. So what we'll do is we're gonna go forward again, okay? Because you know, we have the option here to go forward again, which is you know, give me a number so I can convert it into a double. So we start off with a base 10 representation and we'll convert that back into a double representation with all those 64 bits. So let's go ahead and continue with this slide here. So give me a number, but it has to be a quote unquote nice number in the sense that <laughs> it is a easy sum of powers of two. The power of two can go negative too, just don't give me something that's too negative. Okay, 44.44, does that meet the requirement that I just mentioned? In other words, can we express this as a clean sum of powers of two? Okay, and why would you say that? Okay. Okay, but, okay, but we want to go through this exercise, okay? If I were to represent 44.44, which is the base 10, it's a base two number, 
what would that look like? Okay, so we let me let me spell out some powers of two first. Okay, because that should be helpful. Thirty-two, sixteen, eight, four, two. Oops, two, one, one half, one quarter, one eighth, and uh, is it six, one, two, five? Okay, I'm just gonna end there. Okay, you know, because you know after this it gets even messier. Okay. So now we want to say, okay, what, how, would, how, would we, how do we break down 44 as a sum of powers of 2? Base conversion. Okay, come on. You guys know this already. Or you should know this already. You should have practiced already. So what, did, what, what should 44.44 look like? I don't even want a binary number. I just want you guys to choose which powers of 2 is a part of what we need to add up. Come on, you guys can do it. 32, a 32. <clears throat> so we have a 32 and an 8, four, right? Four, and a 4. Okay, so. So the 32 is pretty clear. 32 plus 8 plus 4 plus 4 is exactly 44, right? Okay, so that part is easy. The point 44 is the problem, okay? Because we have point 44 does contain a quarter, but it does not contain a half. So I cannot put a half here, so we, we have to cross this out. So it contains a point 25. So once I take up the point 25, we have point 0.19 left, okay? So within the point 0.19 left, we're going to have you know, the point 0.125 will help fill that up a little bit. And then after that, you know, the point 0.06125 will also help up the, the rest. But it is not done. Okay? It is not done because there's still a lot of, there, there are still things that we have to take care of. So the bottom line is 44.44 um, 44 in binary is not clean. It's going to have a repeating pattern of zeros and ones. Is that okay? Does everybody understand why 44.44 does not break down to a clean and easy number of powers of two? Okay. So are you are you convinced? Okay, so this is all about base conversion. Okay, this is going back to base conversion, um, which is, I think, the second lecture that we have. Second or the third, I cannot remember. Uh, but it's because of base conversion, the point 44 is the difficult one to convert. Okay, so instead of doing this, you know, may I suggest something a little bit easier that's based on this? We'll just say, you know, 44.325. 375, sorry. 375, because 375 is no half, one quarter, and one eighth. So that's a pretty easy one to, to convert. All right, so we'll start with that. Okay, so we, we'll look at 44.375, and then we'll try to figure out how do we convert that back into a double. So here we go. So we look at 44.375 as a base 10 number. So we're going to break this down again, okay? But this time into base two number to begin with. So the 32 is one followed by how many zeros in base two? How do we specify the quantity of 32 as a base two number? It is one followed by how many zeros? Four, five. Because 32 is two to the power of five. So the number of zeros you know, on the right hand side corresponds to the power of two. So since 32 is two to the power of five, it is one followed by five zeros in base two. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so let's let's double check, okay? Because everything is related to everything else. Okay, so this is not a concept that is on its own, standalone, or anything like that. The fact 32 is 1 followed by 5 zeros has everything to do with base conversion that we have learned already. Tell me again what is the row of each digit in the base 2 number. 
it is specifying the quantity of a power of two corresponding to the position of the beam. Okay, so that is the most important part because everything else is derived from that one statement. So this is digit zero. Remember, we count from zero. Okay, that's important as well. This is digit zero, digit one, digit two, digit three, digit four, digit five. So this specifies that we have one of two to the power of five, which is the 32. That is why 32 in base two is one followed by five zeros. Because the digit zero all the way up to digit four, they're all zeros because the value itself is itself a power of two. So there's only one one in that base two number. Okay, so it is. I think it's important to kind of draw those you know, connections. Okay, so the eight is one zero 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 because it is two to the power of three. The four is one zero zero in base two because it's two to the power of two. And now we are moving into the decimal point. Okay, the fraction part. So the point two five is two to the power of negative two. But remember, what the, the job of the point is to separate the is to separate digit zero, which is immediately to its left hand side, and digit negative one, which is immediately immediately to its right hand side. So we have none of those, but we have one of those. So the point zero one in base two specifies point two five in base ten, which is a quarter. Is that okay? This is all going back to base conversion, okay? This is nothing new. It is base conversion because this is representing digit negative one. This is digit negative two. So we have one at the position of negative two, which means we have one of two to the power of negative two, which is basically what the quarter is, which is accounting for this quantity, the quarter here. So once we take care of the quarter, we have one eighth left, so that would be in base two, okay, I have to emphasize this is in base two, otherwise it would just be 0 0.01 as in one hundredth in base 10. So now we have the, um, the eighth, which is specified as 0 0.001, because an eighth is two to the power of negative three, which means we have a one at digit negative three, so that's why it is known as 0 0.001 in base two. That's what an eighth is, that's how an eighth is represented. All right, so now we add up all of these. Okay, so we have, you know, one, zero, one, zero, one. I think. Or am I, I? Nope, okay, I'm wrong. So we have one here, one here, zero, zero over here, one, zero, one, one in base two. There we go. <clears throat> So the summation is fairly easy to do because there's no parity. Because for each bit position, there can only be up to one one, which means you don't have to worry about parrying. So it's, it's pretty easy to carry out this particular um, uh, addition. So now we have this number in base two. And the next thing I want to do is like, okay, so let me ask you this question. So is this really the same thing as so you don't have to, you can copy this if you want to, but I'm just going to put here times 2 to the power of 0. Is anyone going to dispute this equality, the last equality over here? You guys, you guys are all shaking your head. It's like, Jack, what, is, what are you doing? You're multiplying the whole thing by 1. What is the whole purpose of multiplying this whole thing by 1, right? Well, there's a purpose to it, okay? So because 2 to the power, two to the power of 0, just one, and multiplication by one doesn't really do anything to the entire product, so it's okay. It's not a big deal. So here comes the next question. Okay, this also has to do with base conversion, but it is a interesting application of you know, what we know about base conversion. Okay, I'm just going to leave it like this, and I will move the um, text up a little bit so the people in the back can clearly see the whole thing. There we go. All right. So if I move this point over by over to the left hand side by one position, what happens to the value being represented? Ignore this part here. So if I were to compare the binary number 10110011 one, one, zero, zero, 
to the binary number of one zero one one zero point zero zero one one, how do they relate? So the question is, how do you think about this? Okay, because there are certain things that are common between all the numbers, regardless of the base. So let me give you a base ten uh, example. So let's say we're looking at 29.56, and now we're looking at 2.956. How, how do these two values relate to each other? We'll call the first one, we'll, we'll give them names, okay? So this is uh, M, and this is N, okay? How, how do M and N relate? The base, right there. So basically, n is one tenth of m in this case because these are base ten numbers. So that means, oh, okay. So that means every time we move the decimal point to the left, the value being represented is divided by the base itself. But how does that work? Do have we talked about enough concepts in this class to understand why that is the case? What do you guys? What do you guys think? I'm trying to see if you can you can make connections between the new material that we are talking about to the material that we have already mentioned in the past. In fact, I think it's in the second or the third class. Tell me again what is the purpose of the point? I just mentioned it earlier today in this class. So what is the purpose of the point itself? <clears throat> Separates the base to the zero and base to the negative one. Yep, that is correct. Okay, very good. So the whole purpose of the point, the point of the point here, <coughs> is it is a separator from so that we can distinguish digit zero from digit negative one. Do you recall that I have mentioned that today? Is that in your notes? Okay, because if you have not written this before you might need to put it into your notes. So if that is the case, what I have just done here is uh, what used to be digit zero is now digit negative one. What used to be digit one is now digit zero. What used to be digit negative one is now digit negative two. What used to be digit negative two is now di digit negative three. Is that correct? Because all I have done is to move the digit <laughs> positions around a little bit by one position. Is that okay? But why does that have anything to do with M, N being one-tenth of M? Well, because this used to be specified two of 10, it is now only specified two of one. This used to be specified two, nine of one, now it is only specified nine of point one in base 10, and so on. So. All of these are connected. The meaning of the point and also how we interpret the digits in the number is what is explaining why when you move the point to the left by one position, the value is being, is being divided by the base. Are we doing okay so far with that observation? So if people are thinking, this is a lot of math. I thought this is a computer science class. You are correct. This is a lot of math, and this is a computer science class. But that's only because computer science is a branch of applied mathematics. Okay? <clears throat> so now, when we look at this, okay? So we look at this thing here. So this is representing a value. In fact, it is representing 44.37. Okay, I had a typo here. What do you think this is representing relative to the value that we saw over here? I only need to know, you know, can you can you just describe it? Okay, I don't need the exact value. Can you describe how this value relates to this value over here? It's one half of it, right? In other words, if you divide this value by two, 
then you get this value because we're dealing with phase two and we are moving the decimal point to the left by one position. Great. But that means this equality is not holding anymore because I just changed the left-hand side of the multiplication so that it's one half of what it used to be. I really want to have this equality here. So what should I do to the power of two? Put a one there because when you increment the power of two, you, it, is, it has the same effect as multiplication by two. So a multiplication by two cancels out the implicit division by two by moving the decimal point to the left hand side by one for a phase two number. Are we doing okay so far with that concept? Both what we are doing mechanically and why it works. So strictly speaking, if you need to pass this class, just knowing the mechanism is sufficient. But just working with the mechanism is not gonna help you in other classes. Understanding how it works will help you with all the future classes that you are gonna have to deal with. Because you know, this is, I can promise you, this is not the first, the last time you have to deal with math like this in your computer science program. Are we doing okay so far? All right, so now I go like, okay, if I were to extend this approach and go like, just go all the way, zero, one, one, zero, 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 one, one in base two, um, can someone tell me what power of two should I use here so that the equality is holding? Go like that. Hmm? Okay, so five is correct. has to be raised to the power of five. There you go, very good, excellent. All right, so, but how do we keep, how do we make a sanity check, okay? That this makes sense, sort of, okay? Well, all we have to do is to say, okay, what is two to the power of five? 32. This is one plus blah, blah, blah times 32, which means the product is gonna be at least 32. Well, I think it's Matches 44 because 44 is a number between 32 and 64. So we know that the number of this power of 5 is making sense. Because if, if we end up with a 4, it doesn't make sense. Because if, if we end up with a 4 here, it is only 16. And 44 has at least two 16s in it. If we end up with a 6 here, it also does not make sense. Because 2 to the power of 6 is 64. One time, you know, one time 64 is already 64, and this number is less than 64. So that's why I can make a sanity check and go like, okay, this is 32, and we're multiplying 60, 32 by one point, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's, that's okay, good enough. Because I just want to make sure that the exponent is correct. Is that okay so far? So now we look at this number, and we look at this and go like, does that remind you of scientific notation? Except in when you, okay, how many people do not know what I'm talking about in terms of scientific notation? Because I, I need to double check that we all know what is a scientific notation. We all good with that? Okay. So this is the scientific notation, which means when we have a huge value or really, really small value to represent, we go like, I don't want to have to type in all the zeros. I want to use a very quick and notation to do that. A very good example, there are a few. One is the speed of light. What is the speed of light? Yep. That is correct. 300, millions, uh, 300 million meters per second. That is correct. So. If you are taking a physics class and you have to do some calculations based on the speed of light, you, do you want to type three zero zero and then count one, two, three, four, five, six every single time when you specify the speed of light? Or do you want to just go like, oh, this is the speed of light? I think that is much better. So the question is, 
what is that representing? What, what does the E and the H have anything to do with the speed of light? Okay, did you guys talk about this in CISP 360, the, the double representation and also the scientific notation? Okay, I see some nods and I see some shaking of the head. <laughs> so what, what am I gonna do? I know, I'll just explain it, okay? This is the same thing as three times 10 to the power of eight, okay? That's a shorthand, but this is actual C notation, okay? So if you come from a class that this was not explained, first of all, make sure that you didn't forget first, okay? But if the professor actually did not mention this, then the professor did not actually cover all the material that is needed. So this means the E is basically just a shorthand for <laughs> this entire portion, times 10 to the power of. Are we doing okay so far? All right. So what we are really doing is the same thing because the original number is this number here and basically we are converting into converting it into a what we call a normalized coefficient and then a power of 2 because everything is in base 2 in this case. So once we get to this point, um, we can now you know, kind of extract the many components of this. The first one is the sine diff. Um, is this value negative? Nope. So the sine diff, which is also known as F63, is what? It's a zero. Okay, so that, that's an easy one to figure out. Um, the actual power of two that we want is five. But we know, okay, let me go back to the notes here, okay? But we know that, you know, we are trying to represent five using this whole thing here. This is supposed to be five. So the question is, uh, what bit pattern are we looking at? In other words, if I just need to know what this portion is, and I know the entire thing is supposed to be five, how do I figure that out? You use something that is known as algebra, okay? Because if this is the unknown, okay, the entire highlighted portion is the unknown, and we, we know the power of two is supposed to be five, so we are basically asking x minus 1023 is five. How do we solve for x? Okay, let me, let me, let me present it here, okay? So we'll, we'll, we'll call that E, okay? E minus 1023 is supposed to be five. This five is coming from this five over here. Okay, so how do we solve for E? At 1023 or 1023 to each side, so we have five plus 1023, which is 1028. Is that okay? So this is why you know algebra, you know some basic math is actually important even for this class. CISP 440 has a prerequisite of math 375, which is pre-calc, but this class should also have a prerequisite of at least algebra two from high school, because you know all of this math here is actually high school math. Okay, so now we look at this and go like, okay, but. According to this, we have to turn this into a whole bunch of digits to the F. Okay, fine. So how do we represent 1,028 as a base 2 number? What is the approach? Okay, I know your mental math here, you did all of this in your head. It's not easy. But what is the mental math involved? Express it as a sum of powers of 2. Okay? So 1,024 is a power of 2. Uh, 512 is a power of 2, 256, 128. Um, don't copy all the pluses, okay, because we only need a few of these. So 64 is another one, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, and 1. Okay, so obviously this is not going to add up to 1,028. This is going to add up to 2,023. 40, no, this is, add up to, this is adding up to 2,047, sorry, there we go which has a lot of components that we don't need. So we look at each one and then we go like, uh, do we need that? And then do we need that and so on? D 
do we need 1024? Okay. Huh? This is power that is 2 to the power of 10. So after the 1024, we only have four left. So we probably can go like, yeah, we don't need all of these, okay? And after the four is taken care of, we got nothing left. So all of these are not needed either. Is that okay? So you know, that's help. I'm, I'm giving you a mechanical way to figure out the base two representation of something is to first spell out all the powers of two and then figure out which one you need and which one you do not need. So once we figure that out, as you pointed out, you know, 1024 is two to the power of 10, which means as a binary number, it is one followed by how many zeros? Ten exactly, very good, okay. Because that's what we talked about a little bit earlier today. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, okay. And then the four is two to the power of two, which is one, zero, zero in base two. Okay, not equal to, this is actually supposed to be a plus. So now we add these two. So it becomes one, zero, 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 and one, zero, zero in base two. Cool. We just figure out what is bit 52 all the way to bit 62. This zero here is bit 52. This one here is bit 62, okay? So I'm going to give you the same represent representation as last time, okay? You know, it's not the best way to do it, but it will suffice. So this is bit 62. This is bit 52. Nice. Okay, so I think we are getting there, right? We're getting to the actual in, entire number. Okay, so what we have left is the middle component, okay? This component still needs to be figured out. And this middle component is, in our case, this whole thing here. Is that okay? Because... The value that we want to represent, which is 44.375, is one choice log 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 times some power of two times one, okay? The sign is already taken care of. We, we got that done already. This is also taken care of because that's the whole point of figuring out this particular pattern here to specify bit 52 to bit 62. So what we have left, okay, from the original thing what we, are, what we have left to do is to figure out this portion. Is that okay? All right. So if this is the portion that we need to take care of, the first thing we notice is, oh, uh, there's a one plus already implied here. So that means, you know, in our calculation, which is here, uh, this one point is okay. We don't need to represent it. Because the one plus takes care of the one point already. We only have to deal with the rest. Okay? So that means you know, the fractional part of this, okay, I'm going to call this you know, F here, is really just your know, point zero one one zero 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 one one in base two. Okay? So this fractional part, what I call F here, probably should not call F because you know that's the same name as the entire bit pattern, but that is specifying this portion here. This entire sigma notation is basically um, in our text here, um, 0 0.011011 in base two. So now you look at this bit here. Okay, let me just highlight it. This zero is supposed to be which bit again in the entire floating point number, in the entire bit double? This specifies the number of halves, right? So when we switch back to the equation, um, based on this sigma notation, which digit in F specifies one half or the number of halves? How do we how do we figure that out? We want to understand what I is when you know, we want to specify a half. But since 2 is raised exactly to the power of i, so that means we need i to be negative 1. When i is negative 1, 52 plus negative 1 is 53. So in other words, bit 51.
one is where that zero that I have highlighted in the other side is supposed to go to. So that means, oh, I know where you're supposed to go. You're supposed to go to bit 51. So the rest is easy to figure out. You just you know, the next one is going to specify bit 50, the next one is going to specify bit 49, and so on. So that means, oh, so that means we simply have a whole bunch of zeros after this, just enough to fill up the entire 64-bit path. Are we doing okay so far? So now we, 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 now we put everything together, okay? So we know the sign is a zero. We know E, which is the biased exponent, is one, okay, I'm just gonna copy and paste because I cannot trust my own typing. So I'm just gonna copy this and paste this over here. This is supposed to specify the biased exponent. It is biased by 1023. And then we just have the rest which is the fractional part of the mantissa, which is this part here, as the last component of the entire thing. And I'll just put dot, 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 zero, zero here to basically specify as many zero as we need to pass in order to fill it up 64 bits. So this is the exact reverse of what we did earlier in today's class, because I started off with a bit pattern, and then we converted back into the value that it is representing, this time, we do exactly the opposite, starting with a value and then go back to the actual bit representation as a double. So now we can go ahead and look at this. Okay, I want to finish the entire process. So put a zero, you know, get rid of the space and then chop it by uh, chunks of four. So like that. And then we do a base conversion into hexadecimal. So we have a four, a zero, a four, a six, a three, and a bunch of zeros. So there should be 11 zeros because each zero in hexadecimal specifies four bits. So we have one, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. So this particular hexadecimal specifying a 64 bit pattern is if you interpret the bits as a double, it will represent the value that we started off with, which is 44.375. Is that okay so far? All right. Fortunately, your lab today is not going to involve you know, this kind of math, not to this degree, but it will involve math in some other way. So I'm going to put up some math equations on the board, and some of these is going to be helpful. Um, if you feel comfortable with using log, it will be tremendously helpful in today's you know, uh, lab. So I'm going to start with, um, let's say x is some kind of relational operator. Okay, I'll, I'll say you know, question mark here, y. In other words, this is equal to, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, I don't care what it is. Okay. So if this is the case, um, it also means the log of any base of x is also maintaining this relationship with the log b, whatever base, of y. So what are the common b's in this case? If you have a normal calculator, what is the usual b that you use in the, on your calculator? There are usually two. 10. Hmm? 10. 10. 10 is common, 2 is not. E, 10, 10 and E, E being Euler's you know, constant, okay? So you can choose whatever you want, okay? Um, some of the questions you also need to know you know, as to a specific log. So, so this is important, okay? You, you can take the log on both sides. So another thing you need to know is the log B of B to the power of Z is what? So think of this as two. Hmm? two log nope, it should be whatever b is. Okay, b can be two, can be e, can be ten, but that's what it is. So the next one is if you want to figure out what is the log b of some value, we'll call this w. It is the same thing as 
use whatever law he wants of W divided by the log of D. In other words, this can be log of 10, this has to be log of 10, and then D can be 2. This can be natural log, this can also be natural log. So as long as these two logs use the same base, we can always figure out the log of W using whatever base D you want to use. <clears throat> I'll give you an example. So let's just say that you want to figure out what is the log 2 of 44.375. Okay. Okay. This is what we want to figure out. So the way to figure this out, if your calculator does not have log 2, but it has natural log, is you can just use natural log, which is usually ln you know, on the calculator, but it depends on the brand. Of exactly this divided by the log, uh, natural log of two. So using this mechanism, you can always find the log of something, no matter what base you want to use. So in this case, I want to use log two because I want to figure out how many bits do I need to represent forty-four point three seven five. This will give me the number. Well, okay, the, the ceiling of this number is the number of bits that. Are we good so far? So these are the kind of math mechanisms that you need. So once again, these two question marks are relational operators. So they can be less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, equal to. It's basically it's saying if x is less than y, then log of x is going to be le less than log of y, and so on. x and y has to be non-negative to begin with. You cannot take the log of a negative value. But all the examples, all the questions in today's lab are non-negative values. So you don't have to worry about, oh, what if x and y, x or y is negative? It's not gonna happen. Not in today's lab. Okay, one more thing. Okay, this one is important because a few people got bitten by this one last yesterday. When I ask for a closest value, that value can be more than or less than the original value, okay? So if I give you a value and I say, okay, give me the closest representation, blah, blah, okay? The closest representation can represent a value that is more than or less than the target value. I just need the one that is the closest. Is that understood? Okay. For instance, okay, I'll give you an example, okay? So for instance, I want to represent one third, okay? But you're only allowed to use, um, okay, this is not a good example. I have to give you one that actually works better. Okay, this is a better one. So I want to represent two thirds, the, the actual quantity of two thirds. But I only allow you to specify in base 10, a number that has, let's say two digits. I want the closest one. So what is that gonna be? Six, seven, right? So 0 0.67 is closer to the actual value of two-thirds compared to 0.66. That is the whole point, okay? You Because know, I want to look for the closest one, not necessarily smaller than the value that I actually want to represent. Okay, so this comes in very important, okay? This is going to come in handy in today's lab. Are we doing okay so far? Oh, one more thing. Um, this is in the announcement already, but I, I'm going to mention it also, is our first exam is coming up in two weeks. Okay, so it's not quite now, you know, not next Monday or Tuesday, Monday. Um, so if you go to the announcement, um, there's the announcement of exam one, and it would mention that exam one is uh, two weeks from today, which is the 2nd of October. So if you don't want to miss any important dates like this, one thing you can potentially do is to go to the calendar of this class. I'm gonna show you what it looks like. So when you go to the calendar of a particular class, you want to come to back up? Yep, there we go. So it will show you, you know, all the dates, and you can see, you know, October 2nd is already scheduled to have the exam. 
So what you want to do is to use the calendar feed. If you have not done so, I highly recommend it. So learn how to use this um, feed, which is basically the, in the form of a URL. Your cell phone can incorporate it. So you can incorporate that onto the calendar on your cell phone. So that way, you know, all the important dates of not only this class. If you do this, all the important dates of all the classes in Canvas will pop up on your phone. Okay? Which I think is handy, okay? Because you can just kind of scroll your phone and go like, oh, okay, I got an exam coming up on this date, homework assignment due on that date, and so on. Okay, so this is hot. I highly recommend it. Um, but it's up to you guys to decide here whether that's something you want to do or not. Okay. All right. So that's it for today's lecture. Is there anything you want me to go over before I turn off the recorder? I think I turned it on. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. So if you have handwritten, so you hold the cell phone to handwrite for your student, and so that means you also mentioned that you plan to have hands for the class on Monday of the week or on the next week. I think you mentioned that you were going to answer the previous class, right? So that will be one week before your actual test. So next okay. Monday. Yes, it is actually part of the announcement. Pretty sure I mentioned that. All right, so let's see here. Note that the scope will be different because I, move, I removed some material from this semester, so we are actually further along this semester compared to the last. So uh, all the topics in up to and including next Monday topic are included in the scope of exam one. And I will discuss exam one from spring 2024 next week. I didn't specify which date. That will be next Wednesday. So on Monday, we'll still be introducing potentially new material. And then on Wednesday, we'll go over the test. Mm -hmm. I, already, I also sent you guys this PDF, which is something that you can kind of practice with. Um, so this is the, the actual test from spring 2024. And you know, question number one is going to take some time to figure out, OK? Uh, then there's question number two, and then question number three. Question number two. So part question number two talks about something that we actually did not talk about, which is the borrow look ahead subtractor. So it, it is not really relevant to this class. Question number three is related to this class. Okay. And you know, since this is a practice run, if you guys want to try to try out chat GPT, be my guest. Okay. But I will give you a warning, okay? In order for ChatGPT to be able to be able to answer these questions, you need to upload some of the modules first. Because otherwise, your know, ChatGPT will not understand what is the B test notation. You know, a lot of the notation you have, that I've used in this class is ChatGPT won't understand unless you upload the lecture notes. Hmm? Yep, you have to you have to give it the function. The rest it would understand, okay? Yeah, but two's complement, once again, you know, that's my notation using C2. Um, you probably want to mention that C2 is two's complement or something like that if you want to ask Chat GPT to help you with this. Uh, on the second slide, I was doing a lot of the test questions. Mm -hmm. I thought there was some material that was not in there. Um, Yeah, so there is some here that is still relevant, but for the most part, because we didn't talk about um, the borrow look ahead mechanism, so that means anything that relates to borrow look ahead, you know, it's not, it's out of the scope for this class. But this class is going to have floating point number as part of the scope, because that's what we are talking about now and also on Monday. Mm -hmm. All righty. So I think that covers everything that I need to mention. And I will open up the quiz or the lab. Also keep in mind that I do have office hours. 
Um, the office hour of today is right before the class, but I'm usually available after class too. So in case you want to ask me some questions, you know, that would be a good time to do it. And today's lab is down here. Yep, right here, floating point one. So I'm unhiding it, you can see it now. And then the passcode or the access code is I triple E. On the whiteboard too, I E. All right, I'll let you guys work on this. I mean, if you want to take a short break, that's fine too. I'll go get something to drink in the bathroom. Do that.